Hey, everybody. Welcome to the very last episode in OM System Day. We're super excited to have everyone on today for the final English session of the day. Um, you can check out our YouTube channel if you want to watch the replay of all the other episodes that we've had throughout the day. Um, we had we kicked off the morning with the Claire's in the UK. We also had David in the UK for an English session and then several other language sessions throughout the day. Um, so there's lots of different videos with great inspiring photographers from all different regions all over the globe. Um, so yeah, tonight um, we are going to introduce some special guests. Um, you guys are very familiar with them, I'm pretty sure, because I can see a lot of comments in the comment section about being very excited to see my dear, dear friends, Peter Baumgarten and Brooke Bartelson. So I think we should bring them on. How's it going? Hey, Hello. hey Michelle, how are you? Hey, Brooke. Hey, Peter. Hey, Michelle. It's good to be here, guys. Hello. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm actually, I'm really excited about this. I'm really excited about it tonight, too. And Brooke actually has her own special guest, Bruce, who might <laughs> pop in. Yep. Oh, there we go. Bruce is Bruce also is very, in very, very excited as well. Hey, that's He's not fair. My dogs are in the other part of the house. <laughs> Bruce is a junior OM system photography enthusiast. We He's a really good photographer. Team. Believe it or not, <laughs> he looks like he's a good scout. Yeah, he is actually. He's excellent for that sometimes. Awesome. So we have people from all over the world tonight, as usual. I oh wow, Germany, Austria. Good night to you guys, and good morning to all of the Australians. I saw some Australians say morning. Um, a couple of uh, Canadians on here too. So Peter, your team is here as well. Right <laughs> team on. Canada. Yep, there's another one. Team Canada is here to support you guys. All right. So tonight, what, what should we talk about? We're going to talk about the new camera, right? The OM-1. You got it. So yeah. excited to finally talk about it. I have mine sitting right here next to me. I For those mine sitting here too. I like <laughs> We're all ready. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. We couldn't have timed that better. Good job, guys. <laughs> all right. So we are going to kick off the night and talk a little bit about... Um, the different experiences with the camera and some of the new features that helped your uh, Brooke and Peter's photography, their photography. Um, we will be answering questions as we go along. And uh, so feel free to throw them in the chat as we go along. And we'll also have a roundup of Q&A at the end to make sure that we try to address everyone's questions. We also have the um, OM system team in the chat. They should be able to answer some of your questions on YouTube and Facebook. All right, guys. So. Brooke, I guess I think you're up first. Do you want to do you want to introduce yourself just in case no one knows who you are? I'm pretty sure yeah. everyone knows. <laughs> so um, for those who don't know me yet, um, I'm Brooke Bartelson. I go by Brooke Little Bear on Instagram. Um, I'm a wildlife photographer almost exclusively. So everything I'm going to talk about today is definitely in the context of wildlife photography specifically. But there's a lot of features I'm going to go over that can be applied to pets. Um, like this guy right behind me first. <laughs> um, and of course, a lot of these features don't just apply to wildlife. They'll be um, really helpful for landscape and other things like that too, which Peter's going to talk about a lot. So that'll be really good. You guys are going to get both sides of the story. Um, a little bit of background about where I was shooting and what and why. When I got the OM-1 in my hands, I freaked out for two reasons. Um, one reason was that I was super excited. Obviously, like this is the coolest thing ever. This camera, once I got briefed on it, it looked like an absolute dream. Um, but the second reason I freaked out was because we've had a really slow wildlife season where I live. I'm based in Idaho in the mountains. Um, I'm about 20 miles north of Salmon, if anyone's familiar with kind of the mountain regions of Idaho. And within my uh, shooting reach is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which is usually amazing. It's usually, you know, the most abundant wildlife in this part of North America. But just because of the crazy temperatures and weather patterns that we've been having here, wildlife has been ridiculously slow. So I kind of had to push my limits and shoot some subjects that I wasn't really comfortable with or familiar with in order to get, you know, the shots that I needed to test out this camera properly. So I'm going to talk about all that as we dive in. Nice. All right. I want to see some of your photos because they're amazing. Let's share these. This one is probably one of my favorite Brooke photos to date. I'm not going to lie. So this was so outside my element. Um, I am not a bird photographer. 
I've always wanted to be a bird photographer. I'm a big bird nerd. I have my, you know, my bird book on me at all times, even literally in the midst of a Olympus slash ohm system presentation in case I see something fly by outside. Um, but taking pictures of birds is incredibly challenging for me. Um, the majority of my subjects are megafauna. So we're talking large wildlife. You know, the smallest thing I'll typically shoot is a fox. And the largest thing I'll shoot is a coastal Alaskan brown bear or a polar bear, um, bison, moose, elk, deer, all creatures that are really large and tend to be um, a little bit more predictable in their travel patterns because they are constricted to walking on the ground. Like they don't fly. They don't have the entire sky to choose from when they're moving in a certain direction. So like I said, megafauna, large wildlife was hard to come by around the time I got the camera in my hand. I didn't know what to do. I knew that the eagles are really active um, in this part of Idaho right now, especially as the weather got really cold. So I was like, I'm gonna take a few days and just focus on eagles. And this is gonna be like the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but lucky for me, there's a few new features in the OM1 that made my job shooting eagles easier than it's ever been in my life. And Michelle, we can head to the next slide now. Yeah. So for the first time ever, and I am not exaggerating, for truly the first time ever, I got a slew of eagle in flight photos. Um, birds in flight has always been challenging. Prior to the OM1, I shot with the EM1 Mark III which is a wicked fast, awesome camera. You know, it's got the continuous autofocus mode. It's got the tracking autofocus mode, all these things that for really well-practiced bird photographers make it relatively easy to capture bird and flight shots. But I just don't have that body of experience. Um, I was the queen of missing opportunities. I get tons of photos of birds and owls perched, but the second they go to wing, like I'm blowing it. There's just, there's no chance. And the amount of time I've seen owls or eagles take flight over epic backdrops and just totally not caught in the shot is like enough to make you gently weep or actually like cry really hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the features that made my life so much easier is the True Pick X processor. And actually that's kind of a tongue twister. I don't know if you guys have been able to say that as easily as I just made it sound right there, but for some reason True Pick X processor is like a mouthful for me. Um, <laughs> thank you, I practiced. <laughs> What this enabled me to do is shoot up to 120 frames per second when I was in sequential shooting mode. That is absolutely insane. Um, prior to this, you know, the EM1 Mark III still had a wicked fast frame rate, so fast that I never actually really wanted for more. It never occurred to me that having a faster frame rate would actually improve my ability to capture the moment that much more. But as these eagle photos really prove, I mean, this is truly a phenomenal amount of, of frames. So this specific eagle. Did you actually shoot those before. at 120? Yeah, I did. I did. Oh. And honestly, I think that is the only reason I got the sequence, you know, as as from start to finish as I did. These awesome. two wing postures that I have on the end there, you know, the wings down and the wings up like that are two postures that I've had in mind as like a goal shot for me for years when it comes to specifically eagles and owls. I think it's a really unique angle when you can see the eagles feathers down almost like Freddy Krueger finger <laughs> or Edward Scissorhand figures, you know, like that, yeah. that really dramatic um, downward posture. And then that quick swoop upwards where you can see their legs and it looks like they're wearing pants and you can see the trajectory that they're diving on. It just captures their behavior so beautifully. It's such an interesting moment that you don't really see with your own eyes. So having such a fast frame rate enabled me to freeze the action, you know, at these points where otherwise I probably would have missed these moments and I never would have actually seen these moments with the eye because you just can't process what's happening when it's happening so fast. So this was also like a super unique just moment to be shooting in general. It was pretty early in the morning. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people in the comments are talking about how cold it is where they're based and the cold weather has not eluded the part of Idaho that I'm in. Uh, it's been consistently <laughs> below zero. I think the day I went out to shoot, we were at about negative 11, which feels warm compared to this Arctic blast we're having right now, because I think we've been averaging in the negative 20s and even colder. But it made for a really unique um, scenery. There was a lot of moisture in the air because it was sunnier and warmer the day before. And all that moisture froze. So as you can see in the images, there's a ton of hoarfrost behind the eagles. So I was genuinely like, this is the day to get dream eagle photos. And if I miss these shots, I'm going to be 
truly devastated. So it was just an absolute pleasure. I mean, this was the first feature in the camera that I got wicked excited about because it was the first one that really came through to help me nail a photo. Um, we can go to the next slide because there was actually another uh, feature that I used to help me get those photos. And I used them in this series of images as well. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of backstory about this shot and this series of images that I'm going to tell you guys. This was another really unique encounter where if I had not gotten the shot, I would have been sad for the rest of my life. Um, I went out after my day of shooting eagles, I went into Wyoming. I was in northern Wyoming where I expected to see wolves, coyotes, bison, all sorts of ungulates, you know, deer, elk, moose. Um, bobcats never registered on my list of potential species to see in the area where I was shooting. They are incredibly uncommon in this area. Um, I know that they can occur, maybe the occasional rare like dispersal or dispersal of an individual bobcat can push them into this region. But it was one of those things where like you just don't anticipate going into the field in this part of mm -hmm. Wyoming with the intention of finding and photographing a bobcat. Totally insanely randomly, we're driving along. Um, I was with Arthur Leffo, who was also testing out the new OM1. We were a little bit stressed about maybe we're not going to see any wildlife when all of a sudden this bobcat ran out in front of our car. And right off the bat, we were at first like, oh, there goes a coyote. And then immediately we were like, that is not a coyote. That is a bobcat. Oh my goodness. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> it doesn't happen. We need to get these photos. So we got out of the car. The bobcat disappeared into the willows. Um, we knew the bobcat was moving pretty fast. So like our expectations were really low that we were actually going to see it again. But we walked around the edges of the willows and we sat down for a little bit and kind of tried to devise a game plan. Like, let's give this bobcat a little bit of time. Maybe let's try to track it, see what we can do. If we can get these photos, this would be amazing. And as we're sitting in the snow talking, the bobcat pops its little face out of the willows Aww. and it's game time. So if you want to go to the next slides, um, we... I mean, we had a bobcat right in front of us. It's snowing pretty heavily, as I think you can see in some of these shots here. Mm -hmm. Focusing all of a sudden, like not just focusing my camera, but focusing mentally became really challenging because um, for anyone who knows me, I've been on a mission the last two years to photograph any of the wildcats we have in North America. And I have not had any success whatsoever. I've been aiming for mountain lions, bobcats, and Canada lynx. I've tracked them for quite literally hundreds of miles um, and have not come away with any photos. All of a sudden, here is a bobcat right in front of me. I can't think straight. They're I had stunning not, photos. They're stunning photos. I can't believe how any of this happened. Um, I had used the AI detection AF to help me get those eagle shots the day before. I knew from friends who've shot quite consistently with the EM1X that the bird detection was really great in the past. So I you know, used it on the eagles, everything went really well, but I wasn't yet sure about the AI detection AF feature for photographing animals other than birds. I know that it has been you know, really tested on pets. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously wildcats, as you can tell from the photos, don't look tremendously different from domestic cats. So without even like a second to really think about it, I turned on the AI detection AF and I was like, I just need an autofocus that's going to work right now because I need to pay attention to this cat's body language to get the photos of what's about to happen here. And the photo on the right is kind of what the bobcat did for the majority of the time we were shooting. It was pretty stationary, peering at us through the willows, really curious um, and skeptical. The autofocus was working incredibly. It was snowing. Typically when it's snowing, I'll actually switch over into manual focus. This was the first time that I haven't done that in a heavy snow. And even through the heavy snow, with such a small subject in front of me, the autofocus was just absolutely nailing um, the whole situation. Then the cat kind of sat up a little bit. She licked her lips. And uh, I kind of had a feeling, because I've owned cats my whole life, that something really interesting was about to happen. When cats kind of get into that like playful body motioning, you know what they're about to pounce. But I looked around and there was no prey. There were no birds. As far as I could tell, there wasn't a substantial or noticeable rodent population um, in the area around these willows. So I was thinking, what is this cat going to start pouncing towards? What is this cat going to hunt? And back it turned up, out, back up. Uh, right, it was me and our <laughs> This little bobcat started circling us really curiously, just keeping an eye on us and kind of coming a little bit closer, moving toward mm -hmm. us. 
And and as it was walking, you know, this middle photo was taken while the cat was walking. And this motion is frozen so effectively that you really can't tell how quickly it was actually moving. Um, this would have been a really challenging moment to photograph if I didn't have the assistance of this AI detection autofocus going with me. Um, between the snow, the cat kind of moving in this weird rotational pattern around us, um, it coming really close and then moving really far away again was just a really strange series of events that I'm not really used to when it comes to photographing wildlife. Usually animals are moving across or away. It's, it's very yeah. uncommon that they're moving towards. Um, even when the cat got within, I mean, really close, I'm talking uh, less than 10 yards of us, the autofocus was just firing flawlessly. Um, eventually, towards the end of the encounter, it actually did end up pouncing right at Arthur. Um, didn't get any photos of that because I was just so incredibly like shocked and amazed. We both kind of like jumped up at the same time and we're like, whoa, 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 kitty. We're not your correct prey here. It was a juvenile <laughs> cat. So it was obviously just being playful and like testing um, its own perspectives of its toughness. But it was just one of those encounters that I can't believe happened. And I can't believe I got the shot of. Um, this was the moment that I was in love with the OM1. To have had an encounter like this where I am just so mind blown by what's happening and to know in my heart that if I, you know, miss this shot, I'll be really, really bummed. But be able to depend entirely on my gear, on my camera was just incredible. I mean, I was I was sold. So after this encounter, I lived with that AI detection autofocus on. Um, I almost didn't switch out of it at all. Because once I realized it worked this effectively, I was really starting to get interested in pushing the limits, seeing what other wild species it would work on. Obviously, it nailed it for birds. Uh, it, it nailed it for wildcats. I've seen a lot of people asking what lens and settings yep. I was using. I was about shot. to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so the lens I used was the 150 to 400. I think originally when the cat was in the willows, I was shooting with the teleconverter on because it was still a good distance away. As it came closer, I turned the telephoto or uh, the teleconverter off. And I think it came close enough to where at one point I was that middle photo, I think I was at 150 millimeters. Mm -hmm. um, as for my other settings, I was changing pretty consistently, but I think my shutter speed averaged between 800 to um, 125 thousandth of a second. And my ISO was probably between 500 and a thousand ISO because it was pretty low light. Uh, the entire time I was shooting with this camera body was really low light. Again, the weather was just not ideal at all in any way, shape or form during the week that I was out in the field. So that was another thing actually that I didn't even think to mention. You know, I was shooting in low light for almost all of these photos that you guys are seeing throughout the course of this presentation. And it's so, so strange because they look so bright. Like they look to me from the outside, they look like it was a bright middle of the afternoon shot. That's exactly. So <laughs> and the lack of noise really comes through. I mean, you can see just the smoothness of the backdrop behind the kitty as it was in front of the willows. There's not mm -hmm. a ton of distracting noise. Obviously, there's a lot of snow. Um, but all in all, like it just I felt like I had gear that made this shoot. The, sh the photos show just how incredible um, the actual interaction was. Somebody um, above also asked, did you use Pro Capture at all for these or the ones before? I know that you've used it in the past for like your bear shots and stuff. Are you no, so typically, yeah, I usually use Pro Capture um, almost constantly. For this case, I really wanted to explore like the new features that I hadn't used before. I was really curious about just the, um, the AI detection AF, about the high frame rate. So I wasn't thinking about Pro Cap as much. I is guess in this circumstance like this, you're just trying to jump out of the car and get the shot. And yeah, get exactly. I didn't have yeah. time to really think my settings through. I was just like, what's one setting that can help me get the shot? I'm trying out the AI detection AF. Here we go. And I literally fell in love with it. Right. So now you got to assign it to a button on your camera so you can quickly turn it on. I go. did. So okay, good. That's one of things, actually, I have not ever had a customizable menu situation going on. And one of the things for anybody who doesn't know that the OM1 enables you to do is you can set up a my menu. So you literally just open up, you know, your Olympus or OM system menu, and it can be the first one that pops up and you can just have anything, any setting that you want to be able to turn on really quick right there. Um, that was actually Arthur's idea telling me to do that, which was so funny because about five minutes before this Bobcat came into our view, Arthur Leffo was like, hey, by the way, 
do you love the new my menu? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I haven't really set it up yet. And he's like, you should set it up. Put the AI detection AF right there so you can turn it on instantly. And then boom, clockwork. Five minutes later, Bobcat runs by. I open up the menu, select the AI detection AF, and it's game on, which was really okay. mad. So I install or I assigned birds to the button on the top of my camera. So now when I'm out shooting, I can literally just click that and it turns the uh, AI detection for birds on automatically. So you should do that. Oh, that's yeah. a really good idea. I didn't tell you that beforehand and now I wish I would have, but you should do that because next time you see a kitty, you can turn it on really quickly. And next time you guys are all out in your backyard and a bird flies by, you can quickly turn it on. I... Somebody else actually told me that. I think Ben possibly told me, and I was like, that's such a good idea. And then I just, when I did it, I was so happy. <laughs> I love your confidence that I'm going to see another wild cat. <laughs> I, I am confident. You know, I've, I've been here. I've been here for all of your Instagram stories on that mountain lion camera trap. <laughs> I'm Which, holding up the dream. I know that is happened. actually one quick thing I want to note. So um, Along with my mission to photograph wildcats, I've been attempting camera trapping a lot lately. Mm -hmm. um, I have this motion sensor that plugs into my camera body. I can leave it out in the woods and if an animal walks by, it triggers the motion sensor to tell the camera to take a photo. This is amazing. I've been using my EM1 Mark III for this because it's so weatherproof. This OM1 has a new feature that I am so excited to try out for camera trapping. You can mm -hmm. actually shoot while the camera is plugged into a battery source. Mm -hmm. So I can put a portable battery out in the woods with my camera body, have my body plugged into that battery. And theoretically, as long as the sensor is has some good batteries in it, I can leave my camera out for week, two weeks, three weeks, however long it takes to get the shot. So hopefully next time we do a presentation, I'll have some mountain lion images to share and I'll capture them that way. I believe. But, uh, I believe. <laughs> so we're manifesting another, this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you can assign then, almost any feature to a button as well, right? Yes, that's true. If I'm not mistaken, there's a lot more features in the OM1 that can be assigned than mm -hmm. like in the EM1 Mark III. Just makes it so much faster to access those features that you really are using quite often. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that is really nice. I could see myself getting a little crazy and having like a different feature for every button because there are just so many that really buttons. <laughs> Oh, I forgot that I assigned Live ND to my front button the other day and turned it on and couldn't figure out why Live ND was on and <laughs> so confused. So yeah, there's a lot of buttons you can adjust, which is helpful as long as you make mental note when you're doing it to <laughs> write it down. <laughs> All right, Brooke, I'm going to move this thing for. There we go. This this photo blows me away. This is beautiful. So believe it or not, this was actually also taken with the um, AI detection AF on. I really didn't think that it would work spectacularly on bison because they don't really resemble any household pets. Maybe cows. I don't know how that um, was all programmed. But I think maybe it was just because it's able to locate an eye and four legs. But while this bison was on the <laughs> run, I had that setting on. He stayed in focus even as he was charging through the snow. Um, I use this photo to talk about this next bit of the camera that's so important to me um, because it exemplifies really the conditions that I'm shooting in. Wildlife happens in all weather. Unfortunately, more often than not, wildlife is happening in bad weather. Um, animals tend to be more active when it's cold. Animals tend to be more active when there's precipitation. Hot, bright, sunny days, you know, just like most humans don't like to move around and exert a lot of energy on days like that. It's the same thing for wildlife, especially, you know, in the mountainous regions of North America where hot weather isn't really like your average or your norm. So one of the things I by far prioritize when it comes to the cameras that I'm using for wildlife photography is the durability. Um, the feature that I was so excited about when the OM1 was first released was that it meets the IP53 standard of durability. So what I really love about that is it's easy to say like a camera is durable, right? It's easy to make a claim like, yeah, this piece of gear is, pretty dust proof, pretty weather proof, pretty splash proof and so on. But to actually use the IP53 standard of durability says a lot. You know, it really shows the amount of testing that this camera had to withstand in order to reach a ranking like that. So that was my first thought was like, wow, this clearly went through a lot of testing to reach that standard. Um, but of course I have to do my own testing <laughs> to really agree. Right. So I'm shooting in crazy snowy weather. Uh, like I said, the first day that I went out to shoot, it was around negative 11 Fahrenheit. 
I think our coldest day when we were shooting in Wyoming, it reached just around, just below negative 30 Fahrenheit, which is also negative 30 Celsius. Peter translating for you. <laughs> Got that. For our Canadians. Our, oh, and our Australians. Australians. <laughs> and our Australians. There we yeah. go. For our global brand. <laughs> um, okay. Really, really, really cold. Um, the battery held up like an absolute champion. Like I said, the focusing, focusing through the snow, I had no problems. And the actual moisture that the camera was accumulating while I was out in the field, never experienced a single problem. Um, there were days that we were out shooting and we were hiking such long distances that by the time we found our subjects, like that fox in the middle there, there was actual frost forming on the camera body. Um, you know, that can always be a little nerve wracking when you go to reach for your gear and it's encrusted with actual frost and snow. Turn the camera on. No delays, started shooting, no battery issues. Everything functioned the way that I needed to. Being able to shoot anything, anywhere, anytime is like the biggest key for me. And it was really, really incredible um, to be able to, to get these types of photos in those types of conditions. I think that the camera would last longer than me in the winter. I'm very proud of you guys. And I say this every time I interview Peter for anything. I can't believe the cold that you guys will go out and endure for the photos. I will stay warm, wrapped in my blanket, drinking cocoa, and I will talk on the show instead. <laughs> I'll, drag, I'll drag you up here one day. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. Every time I see your photos, I'm like, I really want to go there. And then I think about how cold I have to be to visit you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. That's real. Um, thank you to our social team down there in the chat. They're doing a great job answering a lot of questions. So that's that's very helpful. I don't I'm see seeing anything. a lot of people asking about the hundred to four hundred with the OM1. Um, to let you all know, I actually didn't test it with that lens yet. Um, but as soon as I do, you all will be the first to know because I'm I'm pretty curious. Michelle, have you had the chance to pair the two together yet? I have, but not for animals yet. I used it for soccer, which is less exciting because it's youth little league soccer. You know, they're going pro soon. But um, yeah, the focus is incredibly quick. And um, I've also uh, tried it with the new 40 to 150. But yeah, both lenses. Oh, no, I take that back this weekend in Humboldt County. That's right. I went and photographed the birds and I was testing out um, the the AI detection AF for the birds um, with the 100 to 400, it, it focused the whole time. And I know if you've been around the show since last year, you know that I really want to be a bird photographer and I'm just not good at it. And I'm trying and I practice often, but I was nailing all kinds of shots this weekend. All of them were nice, crisp and in focus and the whole, you know, you can see the focus box following the bird around the tree. And I was just quietly walking around and the, the 100 to 400, of course, is much smaller and lighter, um, which allowed me to hike through that area for quite a few hours, but, um, really fast focus. I wasn't having any problem getting anything in focus and really sharp. I mean, I shot everything at 400 millimeters and it was all very sharp actually. That's really good to know. Cause I've, I've wondered on that quite a bit. Cause like you said, the 100 to 400 is definitely the smaller, more compact size option. Even though I primarily shoot with the 150 to 400, there are times like if I'm in the back country that I want something smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like that's a, that's a wicked portable combo. The OM1, that lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those features. I love that. That's good to know. Yeah, it was really nice. I mean, I was out there like wandering for a long time. So, you know, I do love the 150 to 400. I like to shoot with it. But when I'm like out hiking, it was nice to just have something a little bit more portable along with it. Um, I'm double checking because I think I might be at the end of your slides. We are. But Peter if, time. If, yeah, we can talk to Peter, but we're also going to come back to Brooke at the end for Q&A. So if something didn't get answered, ask it again at the end. We'll have our, our questions up. But for now, we're going to introduce our cold Canadian friend in the north, Peter Baumgarten. <laughs> hey, that was awesome, Brooke. You, the Bobcat photos, I told you before that I was jealous. I am still jealous of those shots. They're absolutely stunning. Um, definitely never seen one of those here. For those people who don't know me, um, my name is Peter Baumgarten. I live uh, at the top of Lake Huron on Manitoulin Island here in Canada. And yes, it's cold. It was minus 25 this morning. So not insanely cold, but still pretty, pretty nippy. Um, I got the camera, I think about uh, a month ago. And when it, when I received it, I got 
no additional information with it. I didn't have any of the specs. I had no idea what any of the features were. I certainly knew that you know it was going to be uh, improved over the EM1 Mark III and the EM1X, which I've shot with quite a bit. Um, but I, I knew none of the specifics. So um, I just you know went out and did some self-discovery and tried to figure out, well, you know, what is this camera going to do for me? And I have truly been blown away by what it does. I mainly shoot landscapes, but I definitely love shooting wildlife. I do encounter them here, but kind of like uh, Brooke was saying, this winter has been pretty barren for wildlife. It's been really hard to find, you know, subjects to shoot. Um, yeah. And then, of course, I, I do a lot of astrophotography. I was only able to get out once during the last month due to weather. And so I'm really looking forward to next week. The new moon, I think, is on the 2nd of March. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Milky Way season again. So I can't wait to start shooting that. But uh, when I first got it um, that afternoon or early evening, I decided to go to this spot. This is about 30 minutes away from where I live. That's a range light, so a small little lighthouse. Um, I was hoping for some nice clouds in the sky, but I was, I was willing to to deal with this. And the very first thing that I noticed um, when I started using it was the incredible viewfinder. The electronic viewfinder is absolutely amazing. I, of course, I tried it out, you know, when I pulled it out of the box, right? I wasn't just going to run out into the field without actually turning the camera on and so on. So after charging the battery, I looked in and it looked pretty good sitting here in my office. But then when I actually was using it out in the field, it just totally blew me away. Um, I, I think it's got like 5.8 million dots. I think it's more than two times the resolution of the um, EM1X or the Mark III. Uh, for those people who have the 1X, the layout is very similar to, to the 1X and, and a little and quite a bit different than the EM1 Mark III, but it's so clean, it's so bright. Um, and uh, like, if you look at that, it's got the level. So I use, I, I don't know, I, I must be um, geographically or, you know, positionally disabled because without that level, I cannot shoot a straight horizon line. I use it all the, the time. Same way. Um, I always have it on. <laughs> yeah. I never, I never turn it off. I, you know, the, the histogram, I hardly ever turn on and I might turn it on briefly just to check my settings, but then I always revert right back to the, uh, to the levels. The nice thing though, is that even if you don't have the levels engaged, the instant you press the shutter halfway down, a level shows up right where the uh, exposure value settings are. So that switches over to, so that you will be able to see the levels as you're composing your shot. So I find that uh, really useful. And I find, I use the electronic viewfinder all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I hardly ever actually use the LCD. So I don't just use it for composing a shot. I use it for reviewing my shots after I've taken them so that I can kind of zoom in and scan around and see, you know, is this really the image that I want? And I also use it to uh, access the menu. I remember several years ago at one of our visionary summits, you know, saying I I want the menu to automatically pop up in the viewfinder because you know I'm wearing these things right now, but they're only for reading. I don't wear them when I'm out shooting, right? I don't need them for seeing long distances, and so to to fish them out of my pocket in order to look at the menu. I don't want to do that. So I do almost everything through the electronic viewfinder and it really is uh, improved. It's quite remarkable to look through that. Now I'm just waiting for them to uh, put Netflix on there. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, no wildlife. <laughs> I'd, I'd, um, I have gotten so addicted now to looking through the viewfinder for everything, including reviewing my images, just because the quality is that much better that the amount of times people have joked to me, Brooke, what are you shooting when I'm standing around like this? Yep. yep. Reviewing my shots and setting up my my settings and everything is people Same probably thing. think I've Same gone thing. You know, My wife is looking at me, you know, I'm pointing the camera at the ground. <laughs> what are you photographing, a bug? Yeah. No, I'm looking at my images, right? Or I'm changing menu settings, which is, that is so awesome yeah. uh, to be able to do that now because uh, I think you could actually set it up that way in the EM1 Mark III, but I never figured out how to actually do that. I think there was some way of doing that. Um, so the electronic viewfinder is awesome. The LCD is actually improved as well. I think it's um, it does have a higher resolution. And I think it was yesterday where I actually looked at the the two, the Mark III and the OM1, the LCD, and it it is a noticeably cleaner image on the LCD. All right. Yeah. 
So one quick thing, because somebody was asking about their glasses and the viewfinder. Um, polarized sunglasses won't have that issue with an OLED. L oh my gosh. <laughs> OLED? Oh, there we go. I was waiting for you to finish that one off for me. Wow. Sorry, guys. It's the end of the day for me. Uh, <laughs> the OLED yeah. uh, viewfinder. So we won't have uh, polarization issues at all. So glasses wearers rejoice. Um, or if you're like Peter and you take them off, you can just enjoy the nice, bright, yeah. shiny viewfinder. Yeah. And when I'm wearing polarized sunglasses, like I don't actually wear, I don't like wearing sunglasses when I'm shooting because it affects the way the image is, yeah. you know, the way I'm, the way I'm, I want to see it the way it actually looks. So I, again, it's probably not good for my eyes to get all those uh, rays in there, but I don't wear <laughs> sunglasses when I'm actually out shooting. I always take them off. So I, I never actually look through the viewfinder with my glasses on, but it really is pretty cool. All right. So All right. next one. Yep. I'm going. I'm going. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's okay. I'm failing miserably tonight. <laughs> You're doing great. Right. So again, remember that when I'm shooting this, uh, I didn't know any of the specs at all. I, I had no briefing on uh, on any of this. And so I was just sort of, it was a really cool experience for this self-discovery. And so the very next thing that I discovered was the amazing autofocusing, right? So Brooke has spent a lot of time talking about the animal AI, the subject detection, which, you know, I have used. But for me, the first thing that I noticed was just how expansive the um, autofocus area is, right? It's now got, I think it's over a thousand autofocus points, and they go from edge to edge to edge to edge all the way through um, the frame, right? And yep. so all of those uh, focus patterns that you're used to with the um, EM1 and the 1X, right? They're, they're still here, right? So you've got the full range of fo focus points, right? That first image that you see there. Uh, but now it goes all the way from, it, from one edge of the frame to the other, which is awesome, right? And I think they've added an extra one because there's so many of them. So you've got the small and then you've got the single. And um, when I finally learned some stuff about this camera, I had a little bit of a phone call with uh, Michelle a couple of weeks ago. And uh, she said that there's actually four focus points in that small one. Yeah. Right? So, and, and also in addition to these, just like EM1X, you can fully customize your autofocus range too. So you can do three by nine or, you know, yeah. 10 by seven or whatever you want. You can configure it into whatever shape you want. But yeah, it's yeah. 1,053 autofocus points and it yeah. is 100% sensor coverage yeah so this i've already method. so i've already customized one that i use for birds mm -hmm. when i'm kayaking so you know we've got a lot of waterfowl here and so once that ice melts and i get in my kayak again i have a three yeah. by eleven that i put in the top third um and so even if i'm using the subject detection right it'll it'll start there and um i, I found that to be really useful because there's nothing worse than the camera grabbing, you know, a little ripple in the water or a splash mm -hmm. or something like that. And yeah. that's in focus and your bird's out of focus, right? So, um, of course, you know, it's got all that really cool autofocus stuff that Brooke was talking about for wildlife. The next thing that I noticed, um, a couple of things here was just how fast the processing is. It really is. Of course, you know, Olympus has been a pioneer of uh, computational photography, and I certainly have used all of those. I have to admit that when Live Comp came out, I thought it was a gimmick, and then I th thought it was awesome when I finally figured out how to use it. And so with Live ND and the focus bracketing and stacking, that previous shot that you saw there was focus bracketed. Um, and so that's, again, being able to move your focus points right to the edge of the frame was really impressive. Yeah. And I used it quite often because even today I was out focus bracketing some landscape shots and I had the focus point right on the edge um, rather than sort of, you know, that uh, short distance into the frame. So when I was shooting this sunset, right, I thought, OK, well, I'm going to, you know, do a, um, a high res shot. Right. And I think this was the very first high res shot that I did. Right. And I've always hated this busy signal right that you know goes across the screen and we've sort of just gotten used to the time that it takes well it takes a heck of a lot less time now i think it was i, I did a side by side eventually um i did a side by side with the two cameras the em1 mark three and the om1 and uh, the om1 took five seconds maybe it'll just under five seconds to process the shot and the EM1 Mark III took almost 20, right? So this is five times faster uh, than the other camera. And that's what I need when I'm shooting, 
you know, in situations like this, because the light changes so fast mm -hmm. when you're shooting sunrises and sunsets, um, right? With the EM-1 Mark III, there were times where even though I wanted to shoot it, I wouldn't because I didn't want to wait that 20 seconds. 20 seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but when the light is changing really quickly, it's a long time to wait. And so now the time is so much faster. I do remember in that conversation with Michelle, and I think you'll remember this, Michelle, when I looked at the, um, the super control panel and I was looking for the high res shot, right? Because right. in the old, in the old super control panel, that was a quick way of finding, of, of mm. turning on super, the uh, high res mode, right? Go into super con control panel, uh, go to the drive modes in there, find that. Um, and then boom, I'm ready to go. And so I'm looking through the super control panel and it's gone. And I was so disappointed. I thought, what did these guys do? What did the engineers do? It's gone. <laughs> and so on that conversation, I said, I told her, I said, I'm not happy because I want to use it and it's not there. Right. I don't want to have to dive into the menu. She said, you don't have to. There's a dedicated button for it. And I had totally missed the fact that the video record button now when you're shooting stills is the high res button. And it's awesome. So I just click that and I'm ready to go. I did that again this morning when I was out shooting. Um, and uh, now I can also switch really quickly from, you know, a tripod to handheld. I hold that, mm -hmm. I hold the record button down and then I turn the dial right one way or the other and boom, it will, the menu pops up on the LCD or in the viewfinder and I can quickly switch from tripod to handheld. That just makes it so fast, right? And that's what we all want. We want convenience and speed um, when we're in a shooting situation. We don't, don't want to be bogged down by having to dive into a menu, right? And I know that there's a whole bunch of other things that are like that where suddenly you know you just press and hold the button and all of a sudden the, yep. the menu options show up right i think i have the same thing um when i'm doing live nd because i like uh, michelle i've got the one of the front buttons set for live nd yep. and i've got one of the back buttons i think i've got the ael button set for um a focus uh stacking and i i just hold the button for two seconds and boom the menu pops up Right. So that, again, is really convenient to be able to, you know, have that feature at your fingertips right away. Right. I There's feel like I was Santa Claus on that call when you were so <laughs> mad yeah. about that. And I was like, but it is here and I will show you the way. And you were so happy. You were yeah. like, <laughs> I was. I was I'm glad we had that moment. <laughs> right? As a landscape shooter, I want to be able to use it and I want to be able to turn it off and on really quickly. And so mm -hmm. with the older camera, right. The quick way of doing it was through the um, super control panel, and yeah. then you you guys took it away, but replaced it in a much better spot, right? Yeah. So there's another interesting feature with the uh, high res mode that I noticed when I was you know doing some menu diving, and that's the fact that you can actually add a delay to it now. You can add a two second up to a two second uh, delay if you're doing handheld, and up to a thirty second delay when you are shooting uh, on the tripod, right? So this morning I thought I'd give it a little bit of a test run. So it was brutally cold this morning, but I wasn't gonna be deterred. I um, headed out to this spot this morning. So that's me, this is a high res shot. And in order for me to get into the frame, right? I needed a delay because there was nobody else with me. And I plugged in the uh, 30 second uh, delay and so, um, after pressing the shutter, I kind of do that quick run and I'm counting down in my head, right? 1001, 1002, right? And I got into position, um, right? In, in time for me to be in the shot. I don't usually like including people in my landscape images, but there are times where having a person in the shot really does help to provide a sense of scale as it did here, right? So these are some ice features that we've got forming on the South shore of the Island on which I live. And, um, Right, so high res shot with the with the time delay on it now, which is really quite nice. All right, Peter, a couple yes. of questions on the last few images, um, and I don't remember when I looked it up. Uh, what lens are you usually using on these? I feel like it's the same one. Oh yes, it's my beauty. It's my baby. It's the eight to twenty five. Yes, I thought it, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I absolutely love that lens. It is the best landscape lens, right? I mean, I love the seven to 14, but it just, you know, it stopped at 14. And there were just times where you want that extra reach, 
-hmm. and having to switch from that lens because it's a great ultra wide lens right but to, having to switch um to just get a tiny bit more reach was a little frustrating. So when they came out with the eight to 25, I'm okay with, you know, slightly narrower field of view, right? Seven, you know, gone eight now. Um, but having that extra reach is, has saved me, you know, much frustration, not having to switch lenses, right? I still use the seven to 14 uh, for Astro. Like I had it out yep. a couple of weeks ago when I was shooting. So, you know, I'm still going to use it, but I haven't used it for landscape at all since I've gotten this one. Peter, I've actually trialed the eight to 25, believe it or not, with wildlife, not okay. on my camera, um, in my camera trap, my remote sensing okay. camera trap that I leave out on the field. That's the lens that I use in there. Cause similar thing, it's just a super dynamic field of view. It's a great Little yeah, because you just you never know where they're going to enter, right? Exactly. You enter the frame, right? You, what you now need to do is be able to do it remotely with a little uh, jig on there that you can turn the camera. And <laughs> Trust me, I've been scheming that. <laughs> yeah. I've, actually, I've actually photographed birds outside my window while I'm sitting here. Yeah, with the with the uh, app, right? With the OA yep. Share app. Oh you know, yeah. Nest, I've got a I've got a bush right outside my office here, and every year I've got yellow warblers, and I use the OI Share app to uh, to trigger either video or uh, still images while I'm sitting in here comfortably and I don't to disturb the birds at all. It's such That's a good so idea. smart. Yeah. yeah. I, I have amazing birds on my backyard tree and every time I come out to photograph them, they all fly away. They're, birds and me don't get along as much. I just want to be a bird <laughs> photographer, guys. I love birds. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw your Instagram post. It looked pretty nice. Oh yeah, I got some good ones this weekend. I'm very proud of those photos that I took this weekend because, um, and it was literally all the bird AI. I'm telling you, yeah. I would not have got those shots without it. It is such seriously <laughs> game changing. I mean, I'm officially a bird photographer now, and I didn't used to be a bird photographer. It has been <laughs> truly game changing for birds. Yeah, it is. It really is spectacular. All right, next. All right, let's okay. get some night skies. Yeah, anyone who follows my work at all knows that I love astro shooting as well. I mean, it's basically landscape shooting in the dark, right? You know, as if my sleep patterns aren't messed up enough, I got to <laughs> mess them up some more. So, you know, when I got the camera, I definitely wanted to do some night sky shooting. But as you can see, that bright dot in the sky was interfering with true dark sky shooting. So this was maybe three or four days after I got the camera. And so I, this is a location about an hour and a half north of where I am. And so after getting to this spot, I then strapped on the snowshoes, hiked out to this location over this river, um, and it was cold. It was minus 28. I was completely frosted over by the time I was done, right? By the time the sun rose, you know? So I was out there for about three hours. Um, but this is, you know, an ISO 1600. I didn't need a really high ISO, given that, you know, it, I had all, all of this moonlight, but when I looked at those images on my computer, there was almost no noise at all, even at 1600, right? Um, I was really quite impressed with that. Now, most of the time for my landscape shooting, I'm, I'm shooting sort of at the bookends of the day, but I do like sticking around either after the sun has set or if I'm out early in the morning, I want to make sure that I get there before the sun, uh, you know, rises. So it's still pretty dark and I'm using moderate um, ISOs for that. So the next shots there, right? So here are uh, three images that I shot. Oh, we've sorry, lost it didn't there. play them. Ah, yeah. One sec, Peter. Right. You we, get the idea. There, there they are. are. There, there we, we are. are. There, uh, the first two were also shot on the very first day that I had this camera, right? So here's that same range light that I shot, um, and this is just you know an hour or so after the sun had set, and I wanted to stick around and you know, see what this camera would do and, you know, first and, and also just get the shot. Really for me, the camera is just a tool to get the artistic image that I want. And it's a great tool. So those are all shot at, I think around ISO 400 or the last ones was shot at ISO 500. And there's like no noise at all, like zero noise. If you flip to the next one now, Michela, so there's a close up of the um, that final image there. And, you know, even if I brightened it all the way up, right? So in Lightroom, I, you know, brought all, you know, just overexposed it to the max. There was absolutely no noise living in the shadows. It was, it really is quite impressive. That, I don't even know if I can say this, but the uh, backside illuminated <laughs> something or stacked sensor is really <laughs> quite impressive. Like I, I wasn't expecting, I really wasn't expecting it. And it, it really has 
blown me away with just how well it handles noise, right? Now, I did get to go out one night and do some astro shooting, again, in some bitterly cold weather. So there's a bit of a selfie of me. And I, I used a little bit of low-level lighting in the to light up the foreground, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I was, again, really pleased with the results, right? So by the time you get to ISO 3200, there's a bit of noise, but just a bit. So if you've seen some of my Home with Olympus stuff that I've done here on Astro Shooting, you know that I like to stack my images to help, you know, eliminate some of that noise, right? So usually I set the auto timer to take 10 shots in a row, right? Um, sort of back to back to back with a one second delay in there using that timer. And then I'll process those and use Starry Landscape Stacker to get rid of the noise. Well, the image, so here's 100% crop. The image on the left is a single image and the one on the right is stacked. And there's almost no difference between the two, right? Again, I was really quite impressed with the fact that like there's hardly any noise, even at ISO 3200. And so, you know, that begs the question, am I going to spend the time stacking anymore? I'm not too sure that I'm ready to give up stacking because it, it does <laughs> work, right? Um, but, you know, maybe I don't need to or take a lot fewer shots because um, it really is quite impressive, right? And then, you know, I, I know that people are interested in, well, how does it compare to the, you know, the EM1 Mark III? So I took that out and here's, you know, the OM1 on the left, the EM1 Mark III on the right. Now, I know that we're broadcasting this in 1080p and it does not do this justice at all. They both look pretty clean, even from where I'm sitting right now, but there is significantly more, more noise in the Mark III image than in the OM-1. And so if we look closely at that, so here's 100% crop. I don't know if you can clearly see this, but there is definitely color noise in the EM-1 Mark III. Now I did apply in-camera noise reduction. So just so that you're aware, this is the in-camera noise reduction applied to these shots, right? I do wanna go out again and test it without noise reduction applied and see you know, how it handles that. Um, but I didn't do it on this particular night because it really was quite cold. I think it was about minus 25. And there are limits to how long I'll last <laughs> out there, even though the camera does last a long time, including the battery. I was out there for a couple of hours and I think the battery lost maybe 20%. Like I went from 100% charge to about 80%, right? Because we have talked about the battery. It is a much improved battery, right? Yeah. And then I thought I would crank it up and uh, went to 25,600 ISO. And I think everybody can clearly see a difference now between these two images, right? The OM-1 and the EM-1 Mark III, right? You know, the OM-1's image at 25,006 is still not, you know, it's not incredibly sharp, but it's still a very usable image. Whereas I would never consider shooting the EM-1 Mark III at, at that kind of an ISO, right? Yeah, so, so Peter, this was something that I know you and I talked about a little bit before this, but um, the really high ISO capabilities kind of adds, I would say, like an extra hour, you know, in the morning and afternoon that you could even be shooting wildlife. Peter was telling us a story about how he had an owl in his backyard last night, cranked the ISO all the way up, still got a photo where you could clearly tell, even in pitch dark, that this was an owl. So like even, you know, 25 thousand ISO is a crazy ISO to be shooting at. It's not really something you need frequently, but in a circumstance where you're shooting in a pinch, it's really mm -hmm. nice to know, like if you, if that's the only time you're going to be able to get that photo and you just want to have visual evidence that you saw a saw wet owl or you saw a mountain lion, whatever the creature or the feature might be, knowing that like you can still get a usable image, you know, usable for social media, things like that is just totally game changing. So yesterday, I live in a small town of about 400 people, but yesterday I had a menagerie of wildlife in my yard, but there was at the totally wrong times of the day. So yesterday morning, I look outside our front window and a red fox is marching by hunting. I actually saw him dive into the snow. By the time <laughs> I got the camera, he had gone. But in the evening, we're sitting in our dining room and all of a sudden it's dark. It's almost pitch black. I could have done astrophotography. All you know, if I'd waited another 20 minutes, I could have done some astro shooting. And we're sitting in the dining room table, and all of a sudden, this bird lands on the tree right outside our window. And I thought, no birds are flying at this time of the night, unless it's an owl. And sure enough, it was this tiny little sawwet. I thought, I have to try this. Grab the camera. Before I got outside, I cranked it to 25.6. I got about six shots out, and I processed the shot this morning. 
and you can clearly see the owl and with a bit of processing, I could find all the details in it. And even more importantly, the tracking worked in the dark, right? Ooh. So the bird AI <laughs> locked on the bird in the dark, right? At 25.6, it really, it, uh, I was blown away, right? You know, it's, we're literally it's never not the kind of shot that I would publish, but it's the first time I've ever seen a solid owl here. And I've lived here for 30 years and I've been looking for them. We have lots of different species, but I've never seen that one. So I wasn't going to pass it up. Right. So two questions I am seeing reoccurring in here. Um, oh gosh, I just lost it. Sorry guys. Oh man. Oh no. Um, are they raw? I'm pretty sure you always shoot um, in raw. Oh I feel yeah. Like you've spoken yeah. of this before on Starry Skies. We always recommend doing your night sky astrophotography in raw. Um, the other one is, were you using the awesome Starry AF? And yes, follow up answer. It is in the OM1 camera. The Starry Sky AF from EM1 Mark III has made its way into this camera. And yes, it is still absolutely awesome. Yeah, would not be without it. It has, you know, <laughs> I, I certainly was able to focus on the stars previously with the various focus assist features yep. that are in the cameras. But now I don't even have to think about it, right? And it just stays locked on the stars for hours, right? Unless you're switching your lens, you know, or there's suddenly a shift in temp, a dramatic shift in temperature, which doesn't usually yeah. happen for me. It's going to stay locked on it. It's absolutely awesome, yeah. And it's it's there. It's easy to access. So, yep. And I don't know, and maybe I'm just crazy and I'm making it up, but I was using it uh, this weekend. I was shooting the stars because I just happened to be in like a, a Bortle three. It was amazing. And I was like, oh, I got it. I have to. It was a like full moon. So they weren't great, but it was beautiful. But it seemed like um, the Starry Sky AF worked much faster than it used to. I don't know if you noticed that in your trials, but it did seem like with EM1 Mark III, it seemed like it would take a while to really kind of focus in and out. And it was like instantaneous for me this weekend. It was like locking stars. Honestly, I didn't notice that. I'll have to pay more attention to it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it finds it more quickly. Yeah, right? it seemed. But I, but I, 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 I didn't notice that, so I can't speak oh. to that. Trust even, me, when it's cold outside, one, I even notice with the old one, quickly. five or six seconds. I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to wait a minute if it's going to guarantee that it's locked on the stars. Because there have been times where I've been shooting for two or three hours, thinking it was in focus. Even if oh, I no. looked through the LCD, I oh. thought I got it. I've and, done that, and they're all soft, and that can be really frustrating. And it's just it. It's perfect now. Oh, yeah, that would be miserable. Well, for me, and I'm a fair weather friend, I like to be warm. And so it was freezing cold. So that that expedited focusing was a <laughs> godsend to me. I was like, thank you. I don't know why this is working so well tonight, but let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's see. I saw I think I if I remember correctly, what's next? I think I saw a question about this. Somebody wanted to see um, our dogs in action shots, and I'm so happy you included this. All right, so we have th we have three dogs. This is our you know part husky dog. His name is Squish, um, which Squish. is a really strange name, but uh, he <laughs> is such a cutie. And of course, I hadn't you know I I probably had the camera for a couple of weeks, and although I'd been looking for birds and other animals, I wasn't having any luck whatsoever. So I thought I gotta at least test this out, and why not test it on you know, a, a pet, right? So I took him out onto the ice here and uh, a still shot, no problem at all, right? But then I put on the animal detect and, you know, took just, he, he would run ahead and then I'd drop down into the snow and call him back and he would come racing towards the camera and it nailed every single shot. You know, I don't want to say it's going to hit it 100% of the time, but I did several trials of this you know, with him running off and then, racing back towards me and I looked through all of the shots and I would say 95% of the shots nailed the focus on the face, the eyes, the mouth and everything were, were sharp. I certainly had some laughs as I look at all the expressions as his tongue mm -hmm. is hanging out this way and that way. Right? <laughs> and I thought, Oh my gosh, such a pleasant looking dog. And he looks like, you know, looks like some kind of uh, book or something like that. But, uh, like, and I tried it both with the mechanical shutter and the electronic shutter. It nailed it. It was, it really is incredible. Um, so, you know, if you're at all interested in pet photography, it's going to grab it. And as of course, Brooke has already mentioned, and as I've also proven uh, today, um, it, it will grab all sorts of animal subjects, right? It's not just for dogs and cats, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that are dog-like and cat-like anyway 
right? So the only birds that I were, was able to find were at my mother-in-law's house. She feeds the birds. So that's a beautiful pileated on the left and a gorgeous little downy woodpecker on the right. Even though they were, you know, after food, they were flittering, flitting about quite a bit and it locked on quite easily. I haven't been able to do any birds in flight, so I can't speak to that. But, you know, I was pleased with what I was getting birds in flight with the EM1X. And I know that this is much more accurate, much faster mm -hmm. um, than that. And it will go edge to edge. So mm -hmm. I, I am looking forward to those kinds of opportunities, uh, but I just haven't been able to grab them yet. So. Right. We should maybe try not to launch our awesome cameras in the middle of winter when we need to photograph birds and wildlife. We'll let we'll let the higher ups know. This. <laughs> we need summer. It's still, release. it's still been a blast to shoot with, regardless of when it was. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and so this oh. morning. Yeah. So this morning after I went oh. to that, those ice features. Right. Even though I leave to go photograph a landscape in the dark, like I left home this morning at you know 6 a.m. It was still dark out. Um, I still take my wildlife shooting gear, right? So I had the 150 to 400 with me. And then when I got back to the vehicle, I switched, you know, the eight to 25 with the uh, 150 to 400. And then I started looking around and came mm -hmm. across, you know, a, a herd of deer or a flock of deer or a gaggle of deer or whatever the heck you call them. And uh, um, <laughs> right. So I wanted to test whether or not the subject detection worked, right? So C1 on my camera is dedicated for birds. The C2, I've programmed that for, for animals, right? The four-legged guys. Um, and so I dialed in C2. It locked on that deer coming out of the bush there. No problem at all. So I'm a fair distance away. I'm probably at least 100 meters away. Um, and it found it locked on. No problem at all. And then as I'm driving around uh, along, I come across, you know, uh, one sort of right in the shadow of the of these trees right he was poking his head in the sun and in this case it found the head but also locked right on the eye right so you could see the little um focus point you know find the eye it was great right? so that's the only other wildlife that i've been able to shoot um, i missed that fox in the dark yesterday but it's been it's been a great camera to uh work with um, and more importantly, to play with, right? It's just, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's made photography fun. It's given me really, really good results. Yeah, it's been really fun to experiment. I have not, since I don't shoot with the EM1 Mark X, I haven't really had the opportunity to play around much with, you know, an autofocus detection AI before. Um, and I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I was truly skeptical because animals vary in their positioning, in mm -hmm. their coloration, in the way they stand out against the landscape. I was like, how can an AI actually really anticipate what an animal is going to do? I was really concerned about the coming towards you motion, um, because even though that doesn't happen very often, that's usually like a posture or a behavior of a frame that you really don't want to miss because it doesn't happen very often. So I think the images that you got of Squish, which is the best name I've ever heard in my life, um, <laughs> really exemplify just how good that focus detection is, even with the subject coming at you super fast. and. Yep. In your images, you can see the snow spraying up. Um, I do know a bane of a lot of wildlife photographers is these, these focuses that look for an animal's eyes can sometimes be distracted by big snowflakes mm -hmm. um, or anything that kind of resembles the white of an animal's eye. And those photos, again, go to show even with the snow being kicked up and then in the case of my bobcat, even with the snow coming down, I didn't see that as a problem at all. Yeah. Um, the only animal that it did struggle with was moose. And even using anyone who's photographed a moose before will know that even using uh, manual focus, it can be really difficult to nail focus on them because they're so dark and their fur is so short. There's not a lot of definition to like lock onto. So I was like more than impressed when I finally got to use that in the field. It's been so fun trying to like push its limits. So let's uh, take take a quick recap. We're going to recap on our favorite features because I, I love the idea of summizing a story because you guys are such beautiful storytellers. And then we're going to jump into a couple of questions I see popping in. But so here's Peter Free. This is my favorite photo of you ever. <laughs> this is the best selfie you've ever taken. I it's love this. Honestly, it's the only selfie I've ever taken. I have, this, is the, this is the first time I've ever held my phone up, but I knew that I was totally frosted up. So this was that, uh, this was on that early morning when I went out and the, the moon was out and right. So three hours 
in the very cold conditions. And I thought I have to show this. The camera ha handled it no problem at all. I still think I had about 72% battery life left after shooting for three hours. Um, wow. But I was done. Like I was, I was ready to hit, get back to the car um, and the camera could have shot for hours still. But yeah, I, uh, I was totally frosted. You can see that I was out there in the dark. There's my headlamp completely frosted up. But so really to summarize, I absolutely love the new electronic viewfinder. It is sharp. It is bright. It is fast. Um, I love looking at it. The Processing speed, I, I do a fair amount of computational photography for my landscape and macro shooting, right? You know, when the mushrooms are out, that's my favorite subject. So being able to do it quickly, um, you know, makes a difference. Uh, the image quality is really, really good. I was, I was truly, when I brought those range lights, range light shots, that little lighthouse there and looked at them on my computer, I was truly impressed with how sharp those images were and how little noise, no noise, um, mm -hmm. in those shots, right? You know, the autofocusing, mm -hmm. which we've talked about, you know, quite a bit here is stunning. And what we really haven't mentioned much is the new menu system. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to go into that because I know there's a whole bunch of menu classes and videos yep. and stuff that's going to be made, but the menu is so easy to use. It is much more intuitive. Um, and there's little shortcuts that make life so much easier. Yes. And on the note of the menus, we are working on putting together a program. It's going to launch next month. Um, it's going to be a global menus program. We're going to have live episodes. We're going to have Zoom classes and um, lots of different ways to interact with us globally. So in many languages um, to learn the new menu system, because um, as you probably saw on our February 15th live streams, the menu has got a different view. I know David Smith went through it a little bit today on the UK broadcast earlier earlier in the morning. Again, that's on our YouTube page as well. Um, if you just go to the video tab, you can rewatch all of the episodes from today. And there is a good one that has a nice brief overview of the menu in case you want to get pre-prepared for your uh, pre-ordered camera to arrive. Um, but if not, join us in March and we will be there to um, support you as you learn about your new camera. And I'm going to throw this over to Brooke so she can give us her favorites. So my favorite's short and simple. I am going to elaborate too on the menu really quick. I was stressed big time about a new menu. I don't do change very well when it comes to like technical things. Um, <laughs> menus stress me out to say the least. I learned the new menu faster than I ever learned the EM1 Mark III menu. So it ended up being much more intuitive than I anticipated. That definitely could be a favorite feature that I add to my list. But to recap, uh, the faster processing with the True Pick X, I mean, the higher the frame rate, the more likely you are to actually capture every second of the action and not miss the shot. The AI detection AF for animals, I've said everything there is to say, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and the weather ceiling to the IP53 standard. Um, Peter, you reminded me when I was out shooting with Arthur Leffo and we had, we both had the same camera, the same OM1. We charged them that night before in the hotel room together. We were out shooting, it was so cold. I was so over it. Um, I looked at Arthur and I was like, we gotta go back, my battery died. It didn't die. It was at like 85% still, even though we've been shooting all morning. Um, Arthur looked at me and was like, how is your battery dead? Mine's at 85%. I was like, no, Arthur, please, it's dead. We have to go home. <laughs> my and internal the, battery is dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my frozen finger batteries are dead. <laughs> he, I think he looked at me deadpan and said something like, just because your emotional battery is dead doesn't mean the day is over. And we stayed out and shot <laughs> the whole time. Um, so I can never use that excuse again because the battery really held up really well, which I think falls into that whole weatherproofing, weather sealing, durability standard that I just yeah. live. I, I was truly concerned when I looked in the box and there was only the one battery, right? I was mm -hmm. hoping that I would be sent a second battery because normally on a day of shooting, I'd definitely go through two batteries. I didn't go through, I've never gone through a battery in the last month, right? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. the lowest my battery's ever been is 50%. Yeah, same right? actually. And that's after several days of shooting. And I thought, okay, well, I don't want to be stuck out there and finally have it die. I better charge it tonight. Um, That's but a good the battery point. does last a long time. Yeah. All right. All right. I think we've made it to the end of this part of the presentation. We'll do some Q&A at the end. Um, this is just me saying thank you again for joining us. We have a lot of people on here tonight and a lot of people from all over the world tonight. So um, thank you for joining us on OM System Day. And if you're unaware, um, we have updated our Instagram channel. It is at 
omsystem.cameras right now. So if you are not following us over there, we would love to have you be part of our community. Um, tomorrow is Friday, and we will definitely be sharing our favorite um, photos by you guys in the community. If you tag us with our uh, proper at tag, it has updated. If you used to follow the old at Get Olympus, we're no longer there. So make sure you come on over and uh, and see us on that side and interact with us um, like you do in the comment section because we love we love seeing all of you guys interacting and being engaged with each other. All right. So, Brooke, I have a question for you. Um, here it is. Pop it up here. How does the OM1 feel in your hand compared to the EM1? Not a huge That's difference, but... a really good question. Um, so, I talk about this a lot. The main reason why I never shot with the EM1X was just because I'm really obsessive when it comes to having small gear compact. It means everything to me. I'm very tiny. Um, I travel a lot of distance in the backcountry. I need small things that can fit in my backpack, even in my pockets sometimes. So I was pleasantly surprised actually when I first saw photos of the new body, it looked a little bit rounded in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, some yeah. parts look like a little bit thicker just by the design, the shape of it. So I was mm -hmm. thinking maybe it would be bigger like to the touch, but it feels almost exactly the same as my EM1 Mark III. Um, it doesn't feel any bigger by any means. The only differences in the body in hand is that it's a little bit more ergonomic now. I think that's the word, ergonomic, ergodynamic, mm -hmm. the erga thing. <laughs> um, it fits a little bit better. Like you can see this part here for your hand um, is just a little bit more curved now. So I feel like I fit more naturally. So the actual feeling in the hand is only different in terms of it's more comfortable and it is absolutely not any bigger or more cumbersome, which was a huge relief. I will bring us all back together. Sorry. I was reading comments. <laughs> uh, so, so this one's for Peter. So your self timers don't count as selfies for you. Just, that was your first cell phone well, yeah. selfie. <laughs> you know, with my phone, I never use my phone for a selfie. <laughs> that was the only time. But otherwise, yeah, there are times where I will put myself in a photograph, and I just use the uh, the time delay on it, right? The uh, mm -hmm. so and right, and that kind of works to help tell a story in the landscape image, or you know, helps provide a sense of scale. But yeah. So yeah, I, I have done uh, those kinds of selfies. You your selfie game puts like everyone's <laughs> selfie game to shame. It's ridiculous. You've got like, you know, the Milky Way and a glowing headlamp and like glowing ice beneath you. And the rest of us are over here just trying to take a normal selfie. You're the best. You're the king of selfies. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so I Pete Peter, I know you had some comments on the glove situation. Do you want to elaborate on how you feel about gloves? <laughs> well, they keep my hands warm. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be without it. You know, it, it, it's interesting. I get that question so often. I get that question at least 20 or 30 times at the beginning of winter. So I'll answer it again. I have never found a pair of camera gloves, photography gloves that work. So I have a pair of really nice, warm, thick Hestra gloves. Those are the ones that I'm using right now. It's a great brand. Um, and so when I need to, I don't have my gloves right here so I can show you, but you know, I'm handling the camera with the gloves on the whole time. So I'm shooting with the gloves on. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm adjusting, you know, the exposure with the, with the gloves on. I might even uh, be able to adjust focus points with the gloves on. But there are times where, you know, I need to, let's say, dive into the menu or, you know, I can't for some reason, I just can't hit the play button so that I can review the photos. The easiest thing for me is take the gloves off for five seconds and then throw them back on again. Right. It, there's mm -hmm. I I've tried a couple of different brands of photography gloves, you know, with the thumb that or the fingers that pull back. It, they just don't work. They're they're not designed for anything below the freezing point. Right? right. They just aren't designed mm -hmm. for that. You know, in cool temperatures, fine. Um, but not when you get to, you know, intensely cold temperatures. They just don't work. Right. Well, and where you live is much more extreme than where most people are photographing things. So I don't know. You At need, the you need I saw a whole bunch of people saying it was minus this and that where they are. Yeah. So I don't I'm not the only one living in cold temperatures right now. Yeah, what is up with that comments, guys? What, <laughs> why are you living in such cold places? Stop it. <laughs> hey, I love having four seasons. <laughs> That's fair. 
That's fair. I live in California. It's pretty much just hot season. <laughs> oh, also wildfire season, you know. Mm, that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, my favorite too. <laughs> uh, so somebody asked, and I know we went over this a little bit earlier, but yes, um, the new camera does include the My Menu, um, just like the EM1X. You can assign all of your favorite things into the menu there. Brooke uses it. I yeah, know, I do you use the My yeah. Menu? I have, I have a couple of tabs. So I have a My Menu for landscape. And mm -hmm. then I, you know, just hit the dial once. And then I've got all the things that I might need for astro shooting. So I can turn noise mm -hmm. reduction on and off very quickly. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I've got the night vision in there, so I can turn that off and on quickly, right? So there's, so I've got a couple of them. Because yeah, once you once you figured out what you want, um, I I just go to my menu. I hardly ever go to anything else because I've dumped everything into my menu. I was trying to find a follow up question, but man, your gloves conversation has sparked like an a. a frenzy of glove conversation yeah, this is so <laughs> there's so much <laughs> I, i'm sure that there are other ones out there right you know, the heated gloves and all these things but like i'm the pair that i'm using i like um and uh, i'm gonna stick with them for now <laughs> that is so funny um because it started a complete glove debate in the <laughs> chat. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I, I, see <laughs> that. I, I see that going by right now. I haven't read them all okay. yet. <laughs> um, okay. And I just checking up. It seems to be we're at the part where everybody starts saying that they like you guys and you guys are doing a great job. So I do like that. Thank Thanks, you, guys, Sarah. for being Thank awesome you. and joining yeah, us. This, is, this has been fun. I'm... I'm so thrilled to have been a part of it. And again, so thrilled to be uh, on it with, with Brooke because I truly admire her work. So uh, yeah, Peter, it's you always, every time we do anything together, I always leave so inspired because your creativity when it comes to this, it's always creative when it comes to photos. I always leave like with, oh my gosh, I want to try this landscape thing or this Astro Strip thing. But now your creativity with programming the OM1, like all the menus and buttons, I can't wait to get off this and like set up multiple like my menu sections and everything that's it's stuff i don't really technically think of by myself so you're always on top yeah. of everything no it's a, it's a blast working with others right and michelle you do an awesome job on these events Aww. right i love having you guys on here you every i i love having everyone on here but you guys are my favorite to joke with <laughs> and have a good time and be silly <laughs> um Couple of questions I just want to clean up before we say goodnight. Um, I see a lot of questions about when these are shipping. Now that is going to vary because you are on the global channel now. Uh, so we're going to say early March because it varies that first to second week of March, depending on where you live. Um, Europe is getting it on a different date than Australia and we're getting it on a different date here in the US. So I'm going to stick with early March. Um, there are promo deals, um, again, varies by where you live. So if you pre-order, um, before March 3rd, I believe, um, there's different deals depending on your region. So if you head over to um, any of our web pages that are geared towards your region, they'll be able to give you the breakdown on the OM1 page of what the promotion is in your region. Um, and of course, those um, special promotional offers are available at your local camera store as well. So if you prefer to shop at your local camera store, um, you can definitely do that as well. A quick observation uh, on that, you mentioned that yep. the launch wasn't the best timing for wildlife photography, but the actual camera's shipping is like the best time of year for wildlife photography because end of March brings bird migrations, yep. baby season for all the animals. That's like yep. prime time. People yep. ordering the camera are not going to miss the action. I cannot wait for the migratory birds to return, right? All the sandhill cranes, all the ducks, right? It's going to be awesome. So the questions are coming so fast tonight. Thank you guys, everyone. Um, somebody just asked if you guys, either one of you shot with the HLD 10 grip. And I don't know that either one of you had it. Did you? Or did you? Oh, I did. It. Yeah, I, I got it sent to me. I have it right um, here. But oh, to be perfect. honest, I, I haven't shot with it yet. I haven't oh. even attached it yet. Oh, so. so I randomly, when I first got it, I was like, I'm not going to use this because I want everything to be small all the time. But then I'm also starting to try a little bit of video things, which I've been super pleased with about as well. I can't speak to any video technical stuff, guys. I'm really sorry. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, all I know is that the videos look pretty. <laughs> so therefore, that's great. But um, I put the grip on there to help stabilize the camera for when I was shooting video. 
Um, and it, it really made it, it's a super great balance. Um, I think it makes it pretty similar to anyone whose hands are used to the EM1X. Um, mm -hmm. It's a similar shape once you've got the grip on there. So. Yeah, I've, I've heard a couple of reviews from other people that have tried it that were previously EM1X shooters that prefer it with the grip. So if you're mm -hmm. coming from EM1X, that might be the route you want to go. Whereas if you are like Brooke and you're preferring to shoot with that smaller portable camera, the EM1 style, and actually I did just see a question about it compared to the EM5. Sorry, I just messed up my hair. Um, it's going to be similar to looking at the EM1 Mark III versus the EM5 Mark III. So it's the same body difference. Cheryl, I think, is that who asked that. So, um, but yeah, uh, this could go all night. So we should probably uh, <laughs> say our adieus. Um, this is available, like I said, on replay. Um, Peter and Brooke are welcome to join into the conversation on YouTube later on. There's a comment section there or on our um, Get Olympus Facebook page. You can check us out there. Um, and we will try to make sure that we get all your questions answered um, and caught up. Um, Peter, closing remarks. What do you say? Thank you for coming tonight. Oh, no, thanks for well, the invite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's it's a blast. I love this camera. Um, it really has kind of uh, rekindled my love of photography. Um, there are times where you kind of get in lulls. I think every photographer mm -hmm. does. Um, mm -hmm. If they don't, I'm envious because there are times where, you know, you just don't feel like going out and shooting and that can last. And this has, this is such a beautiful piece of equipment. And I remember once upon a time saying, you know, years ago when I joined the visionary team, I said, you know, I, I want a camera that doesn't get in my way, right? That really does help me see my artistic vision. And I always mm -hmm. found that, you know, the EM1 and the M5 Mark II and the, the, all of those cameras did that for me, but this does it in spades, right? When I can, can I, when I can just shoot and not have to worry about figuring out where a setting is and that kind of thing, that makes it so much easier, right? Well, and the menu is so quick to navigate now too. I, I yeah. feel like that you navigating with the front dial and moving things around, I feel like it's maybe more intuitive. I'm not, for me, I guess like it's much easier for me to just quickly scroll to what I want to get to yeah. and go. Yeah. Totally. You know? yeah. And that's, so, that's what I mean, right? The camera doesn't get in your way. It actually, right. yep. It, it's so easy. I mean, with the menu, it, my muscle memory needed to be retrained. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. Right. So with all of the other menus, you have to hit the 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 right arrow right on the on the pad there in order mm -hmm. to get into the next level. And right. This one you just press OK. <laughs> so that that took a, a couple of days of playing with it to figure out I don't need to do that anymore. But once you've you know corrected your muscle memory, it's it's awesome. Yep. Brooke. Did you have fun? Did you enjoy your time? <laughs> this was awesome. I could not be more stoked on the camera. Um, I'm going to talk about animal detection AI AF for the rest of my life because I'm now a bird photographer and it's really exciting. Um, <laughs> if, anybody, if anybody wants to talk more about the camera or see more of the photos that I've shared, you can find me on Instagram at Brooke Little Bear for now, but I might eventually change it to Brooke Little Bird now that I can actually. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, seriously, this has been awesome, guys. Thank you for having us, Michela. Um, Peter, thank you for your oh. expertise and knowledge and all the things that you inspired me with today. And for everyone who tuned in, thank you all for joining. Um, I think you're going to love the camera once you get your hands on it. It's really been awesome and so fun to shoot with. Yeah. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to you, Michela. Um, and I will eventually read through all of these comic comics comments. <laughs> and, We're all uh, done. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah. respond to them if there are any specific questions. But and uh, night, it is Bruce. a it is a fantastic camera. Oh, good night, Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> Bruce <has> good night. <laughs> Have a great day, and we'll see you next month.